and we were going to do it a better way. Uh, and th that was to start the first fiduciary model PBM. S so just real quick, again, my background is manufacturer, negotiating rebates with PBMs, mail order pharmacy owner, sitting at the table with PBMs, negotiating reimbursement contracts, as well as with wholesalers to get product onto our shelves. Due to the frustration coming from uh, that experience, I sold the mail order pharmacy, decided to start a PBM, kind of, you can't, if you can't beat them, join them, but we were going to do it the right way. And that's what we're here for today. I want to talk to you about kind of the right way in which PBMs should be behaving with their clients. And if they aren't, what you can do about it. If you have any questions for me, you can send those questions to me via chat. Everyone's muted for obvious reasons. You can send those questions to me via chat. Or if you want the floor, there is a raised hand, uh, raise hand feature on your control panel, at which point you could use that. Uh, and then I would unmute you, and then we could have, uh, have a, com a, com a conversation. So by the end of this presentation, three things. First, don't want to waste anyone's time. Right, that's most important. So I want you to know how PBMs make money. Once you learn how they they make money, and, and, and not just secondhand information, because I own a PBM, I got nothing to hide based upon our business model. Whatever I know, I want you to know. That's in our best self, that's in, that's in our self-interest and, and in yours as well. So I want you to feel something other than indifference about what you learned today. And then I want you you to take some action. And that action stems around the primary problem as it pertains to PBMs and their relationships with their clients, whether those clients are, are self-funded uh, self large employers, uh, unions, it could be at the state level, the federal level, coalitions, whomever. The problem is around pricing or maybe indirectly around a lack of transparency or transparency. But my solution that I'm offering up today isn't for you uh, uh, if, if you're one of those PBM clients or if you're an advisor to one of those PBM clients, isn't to go out and ask for bigger discounts or to ask for bigger rebate guarantees. It is to get more information. PBMs intentionally make it difficult to ascertain or to calculate how much money they themselves are generating on a per client basis. This is an example of that problem. So let me back up. Information is uh, a theory uh, based around contract theory for, with, with, with attorneys and economic theory. And it simply states this, when one party has access to information, that another party doesn't have uh, access to. And these two parties, these two entities are sitting at the negotiating table. The party with the better information is gonna use it to its advantage. It's gonna leverage that information. Moreover, the party who has the knowledge to interpret that information. So there's two pieces, you gotta have the information and you have to have the knowledge to be able to interpret that information. And PBMs have been doing this now for the better part of a decade and a half, leveraging information asymmetry or information failure to their financial advantage. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. This is a perfect example of a, a large client, for goodness sakes, this is a health plan. For, for goodness sakes, this is a health plan that can't get access to their own data. And as soon as that happens, you may as well give the PBM a blank check. You may as well give, give them a blank check and say, have fun for the rest of the year.
this is an example of, of what information success looks like. And this is a, a receipt of sorts. Whenever we receive rebates, rebate payments from a, a drug manufacturer, we receive an explanation for those payments at the claim level. Meaning every rebate or every claim that was eligible for a rebate, we received the detail from the manufacturer on that rebate eligible claim. What pharmacy it was dispensed from, what date it was dispensed from, what's the claim number, the quantity, uh, the day supply, and then uh, most importantly, what was paid. What was paid on that claim by the drug manufacturer. 90% of third party payers, meaning the clients of PBMs, have never seen something like this. All they receive is a single line item uh, uh, kind of invoice uh, for the rebates that are going to be paid. Not even an invoice, it's an explanation of payments that's a single line item for Q1. Uh, 2021, here are your bucket of dollars without any detail specific to each claim that earned a rebate. What do you think a PBM is going to do with that, that sort of information that it has and it clients, its clients do not have? This is what they're going to do. And this has been the status quo now, again, for far too long. And the status quo says this. A PBM's client enters into a deal with that PBM that calls for an artificially too low administrative fee. That artificially too low administrative fee could be on the pharmacy side as well as on the medical administra administrative side. Meaning in, in the, on the medical side, it could be if you forego your rebates on the pharmacy side, we'll give you a, a rebate credit to your medical administrative fee on the medical side. If it's just the pharmacy side, the PBM might say, uh, you know, we're going to charge you 25 cents per paid claim as your administrative fee. And in exchange to the unsophisticated plan sponsor, to the unsophisticated consultant, in exchange for accepting that artificially too low administrative fee, the PBM is going to generate its fees, its management fees by way of hidden cash flows. Meaning they are going to take money off the top of claims through mail, retail, and manufacturer revenue, or in other words, rebate. The problem with that is, is, again, when I back up, you don't know how much they're taking. Oh, we're, we're just now getting to the good part. We're just now getting to the good part. And so if you don't believe that first slide where the PBMs profit almost 50% of it is coming from manufactured, the manufacturer revenue, or in other words, the rebates. You could also refer to them as refunds. Here's a second source that says the exact same thing. Now, some of you have been in this game for a while. You can remember that back in the early 2000s when it was the small molecule brand drugs that were the talk at that time. Right. That's how PBMs were making a bunch of their money. And then you got wise and you closed that off. The PBMs then shifted that lost revenue or your cost or your client's cost to remember mandatory mail order. And then when that got shut off and so uh, or reduced, the PBMs then 
what have they done now? Switch their fees to specialty drug rebates. We can extend this out. So this is coming, this is getting, this is shrinking now. This is shrinking now already through, uh, whether it's through better contract negotiations, more education, uh, uh, patient assistance programs, international procurement programs, where you're carving out the specialty and there may not even be a claim in which rebate is going to be paid on. And so that's shrinking now. And now those PBMs have moved to what's called MBDCs, medical benefit drug claims. There is a reason that you have at one time where we're independent PBMs now falling under the umbrella of, of carriers or vice versa. That's where the money's at. It's, it's not necessarily about uh, synergies that ultimately are going to reduce costs for their clients. That's crap. That's where the money's at. So on the medical side where prescription drugs are concerned, it's the wild, wild west. There's a lot more I can say about that, but we don't have time for that today. So, so here's what I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting at. There's only two types of PBMs, really, when you boil it down. Either the PBM is contractually obligated to act in its client's best interest, or it's not. And if it's not contractually obligated to act in its client's best interest, and that means it can't go to the table negotiating for itself. It can't engage in any self-dealing. That's what it means by always acting in your client's best interest is that your interests don't matter when you're at the negotiating table. As a PBM, we negotiate with pharmacy networks. We negotiate with manufacturers. We bring all those savings to our client and say, this is what we believe our service is worth because of the negotiations that we've done and the services that we provide. It shouldn't be we negotiate for ourselves and then charge you a low administrative fee without you knowing how much money we're making. Before I move on, you got to understand uh, the, the reimbursement uh, and distribution system model, how how the product flows, how the, the contracts flow, and how the revenue flows. Let me start with the, uh, the contra contractual relationship. I just touched on it. As a PBM, we contract with pharmacies to have sites from which prescriptions can be dispensed to our clients' plan participants. And then we obviously have to have clients to provide those services too. Those clients are third-party payers, health plans, uh, th that include state, municipalities, uh, unions, uh, uh, co coalitions, large employers. It's a, a fairly exhaustive list. And in terms of the, the financial flow, we reimburse pharmacies for the prescriptions that they dispense to our plan participants. Unless a PBM owns a specialty pharmacy or a mail order pharmacy or, or, uh, or even chain pharmacies, we don't take control of the product. In fact, Caremark and CVS, the chains, should be operating independent of one another. You know, you should be, you shouldn't be able to, and this is legally, you, you can't be a PBM say, hey, we're getting this big client and then call over to, you know, the central field or, or distribution center and, and say, hey, you know, let's work out a better deal specific to this client. You can't be doing that. So as a PBM, unless we own, uh, uh, you know, uh, a mail order pharmacy or, or a specialty pharmacy, uh, we don't take control of the product.
And so we reimburse pharmacies for the prescriptions that they dispense, and then we bill our clients for those dispense prescriptions. And this is where the fun begins. There's three problems primarily here. The first one is the inflow of cash in the form of formulary rebates. And remember this formulary rebates, we're going to come back to it. The inflow of cash uh, in terms of the rebates paid are too low. You saw on two slides where the PBM's profit now from the manufacturer revenue or rebates is 50%. It's now public information. It's no secret anymore. Depending on the drug, some PBMs are keeping as much as 60% of the rebate. Think of, that, gives, that sends shivers down my spine. It's public knowledge. Now, it's not true for all. It depends on, a lot, there's a lot of factors that, that go into when, when PBMs and, and sit down at the table with manufacturers, but there are drugs now where the PBMs have negotiated a refund from the manufacturer as much as 60%. Think about that for a second. That's the first problem. The second problem is the reimbursement uh, or, or the cost of the ingredients coming back from the third party payer to the PBM. That is too high. So the rebates coming in are too low. Painting a picture here. It's going to be beautiful when we wrap this up in the next 10 minutes. But painting a picture here, the rebates coming in are too low and the cash going out to cover ingredient costs from you or your client is too high. Now, we're going to talk about what that is in here in a second. But the third problem, which does not jump off the page at you, and let me, let me clean this up here just a little bit. But the third problem, is when you look at this system, look who sits at the very top of it. You do. Your clients do. Because you fund the entire system. The problem is you know the least about how it works. Everyone else has insider information except for you. And that's why we have this pricing problem. It is the primary reason we have a prescription drug pricing problem. You don't believe me? Stick around. In that slide that I shared with you, the example of the problem where that director of compensation and benefits entered into a deal with the PBM where they couldn't get access to their own data. In that same conversation, that person said to me, essentially, education wasn't going to help them. Uh, I, I mean, for, I, listen, I know we're all bombarded with content. We're all overwhelmed with content. But you can't take that position. The drug pricing standard, which forms the basis for discounted prices, is known as AWP. In the pharmacy business, we refer to it as ain't what's paid. The reason is because no one pays AWP. It's an artificially inflated price that no one pays. Very similar to going to buy a new automobile. You've got the MSRP and no one pays MSRP. No one pays MSRP. Now, I mean, you know, you might pay MSRP for a Lambo or something like that. 
That's a specialty card. Prescription drugs are not specialty. They're a commodity. PBM services are commoditized, folks. Marketing may make it seem special, but it has been commoditized. No one pays AWP. The second type of price benchmark is referred to as MAC or maximum allowable cost. It is closer to the actual acquisition cost, much closer than is AWP, but even MAC is higher than the actual acquisition cost. This is something I post on my blog uh, every Thursday. And it is, we show the AWP, the WAC, and the actual acquisition cost of the product, what the pharmacy pays to put the product on the shelf. And so I want you to see AWP and MAC in action, right? So those are the two primary benchmarks, price benchmarks that determine the third party payer, payer's cost, right? Agreed. So let's do AWP here. Follow me. Let's do AWP here. And then we've got Mac. And by the way, um, there should be four components in what the um, four components in what pricing co components or benchmarks that determines ultimately what a plan sponsor is going to pay for a prescription drug. PBMs also engage in self-dealing in manipulating those components. You've seen it out there uh, with these clawbacks, all right? And so there should be a minimum of four. You've got the AWP minus discount, you've got MAC, you've got UNC, and then you've got the member's cost share. If the drug's cost is lower than the member's cost share, not only should the, the member's cost share be reduced, to match that lower cost if the, if their if their copay is higher than what the drug costs the plan has no cost then Th that has a name but uh, again we only have 30 35 minutes today so 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 here AWP Mac um and so let's look at uh uh, levothyroxine, 100 micrograms, uh, 30 tablets with an AWP of 561. Let's call it AWP of 560, okay? Now, let's say you get an effective rate discount negotiated for levothyroxine of 85%. That means approximately $475 is going to be deducted from that AWP. You see why we're talking about here? It's artificially inflated. And so, and so now you've got now a cost to the plan of 25 of $85. That looks like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? It looks like a pretty freaking good deal until you know what it costs the pharmacy to put the drug on the shelf. Now, this information I'm sharing with you here is at least probably a year old. I just haven't updated the slide. Again, we update it every week on my blog. Um, uh, uh, but, it's consistent throughout. Doesn't matter the date. The same thing is happening. And so here's the point I'm making. Let's say the PBM is generous and reimburse and gives the pharmacy a hundred percent markup. Remember, I left the pharmacy business because we were taking L's on a lot of claims, meaning we were underwater on a lot of claims based upon what we paid and what the PBM reimbursed. And it's happening to a lot of pharmacies. That's why you have all this new legislation 
from, from both the federal and state level taking place because it's being driven by the NCPA, the National Community Pharmacy Association, because a lot of independent pharmacies were taking losses on drug claims, especially generics. And so here, uh, Let's so let's say the PBM gives a generous markup of 100%. We can even include a dispensing fee. Let's call it two bucks. The PBM now has out of pocket ten dollars. That leaves a seventy-five dollar spread to the PBM. That is one of those fees that has been made difficult to ascertain that leads to higher costs for you. So two things you would need to have to know whether or not, so when you get into these deals that say, hey, no administrative fee, or we're gonna charge you 50 cents per paid claim, this is happening. Now, if the drug was on the MAC list, right, let's say the, the price on the MAC list was $15. The PBM's out of pocket doesn't change. Now, the spread is $5. Well, you may be thinking $5 isn't much. Are you kidding me? With the number of claims we process, Backing this up, the state of Ohio, and I'm going to speed through this. Hang in there with me. The state of Ohio, this is about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, audited its PBMs. They did something different this time, though. They pivoted. And this is not anecdotal information I'm sharing with you. This is firsthand, okay? Just let's, let's leave it at that. If Greg were here today, what he would tell you is, it's not you know, information we've never had before. It's information they never considered to look at. It's information they never demanded. And see, there's that word again. There's that word again, information. What they were looking at is, how much money are you making? How much money are we paying you? And what they uncovered was almost a quarter of a billion dollars just in spreads. Just in spreads. Remember, the bulk of PBM's revenue overall is coming from what? rebates. Now, it depends on the client. Some clients, most of the PBM's revenue is coming from rebates uh, and none of it from spreads. Other clients, it's coming from spreads and maybe less of it or none of it coming from rebates. Depends on what you negotiate. Depends on how sophisticated you are around PBM service agreements. Speeding up, hang in there with me. I'm about to wrap this up. Hang in there with me. Misleading contract language. Uh, MAC list rebates. PBMs can have multiple MAC lists. And, the, and if they're non-fiduciary, you're safe assuming that not only do they have different MAC lists among their clients, the MAC list with pharmacies are different than those of their clients. What do you think happens? Spreads. Meaning the PBMs has got to pay the pharmacies, so their MAC lists are going to be more comprehensive, more aggressive, meaning there are going to be more generics on that MAC list, and the prices on that MAC list for reimbursements are going to be lower than what you're being billed. That's what creates the spread. Rebates my many names.
games, again, in that reimbursement and distribution system model, we saw the inflow of cash. I talked about that as the first problem being too low. If you remember, it said formulary rebate at the top there. There's different names for rebates. When PBMs, if they're non-fiduciary, they can sit at the table uh, with a manufacturer or a rebate aggregator and say, okay, uh, we want 25% of dollars to be called formulary rebates. We want another 25% of dollars to be called an administrative fee, which is different than the administrative fee you you pay to get access to claims processing uh, a member a member portal 24 hour cus, uh, call center that administrative fee is different than this administrative fee and it it tricks some people when you see it in a contract you think oh that's that's not significant it's insignificant so we're just going to overlook it that's a mistake market share rebate again so these are just three names for types also discounts uh, uh product uh, purchase discounts from a that's a rebate it's a refund that the pbm's client is entitled to this was uh made public about uh, maybe two two and a half years ago so it was it took a while for the once the lawsuit uh uh, uh was put into play and between that time and uh, it being made public, but here's what I want you to see. I talked about the administrative fee. It dwarfs the formula rebate. Express Scripts sued this biologic, manu this specialty drug manufacturer because this the specialty drug manufacturer didn't want to pay the rebates based upon the contract. And so because of that lawsuit, this information was made public. This is, th this is the same lawsuit. And what I want you to see here is look at this, price protection rebates, right? Price protection rebates for one drug from a, a, a small manufacturer, uh, Kaleo, almost $5 million for 2016. It dwarfs the administrative fees and the formulary rebates. So many of you are getting based upon the language uh formulary re rebates but missing out on some of these other types of rebates that's how the pbm can keep 50 60 65 percent of the revenue coming back from the manufacturer because their clients aren't uh forcing their hand to pass that money back These are performance or outcomes-based rebates or refunds, whichever you choose. It's appropriate. And it's based upon the performance of a specific drug. And here are the metrics based upon these drugs. And if the drug doesn't hit that metric, then the PBM either gets a 100% of their original cost back or some lower percent that's whatever's negotiated. The bottom line here is, is that I talked about it in the very beginning. PBMs intentionally make it difficult to determine what they're being paid. The state of Ohio pivoted and said, listen, uh, you know, rebate guarantees, uh, AWP discount guarantees, we need to have those. But coupled with, with those, we need to have a better understanding what you're going to make as a result of those guarantees. The significance of that is, this is the genius of the, the, the PBM industry and it's their revenue models, our revenue models. Even though I don't agree, I got to put myself in the bucket, our company in the bucket, because we're a PBM. Our fees are here. In the final cost of the plan. So you want to know the difference between a fiduciary model and a non-fiduciary model PBM? Right? You know what you pay us. It's admin fees. 
it inevitably leads to lower costs when you find someone's hands in the cookie jar and you tell them to take their hand out of the cookie jar. That means you're going to have more cookies in the cookie jar and you don't have to run back to the store to buy more cookies to fill up the cookie jar because they're not leaving as fast. With the non-fiduciary PBM, their fees can come from ingredient costs, remember spreads, and also the rebates when they don't pass it all back. I'm going to show you what this means to you here in a, in a second. Furthermore, and this, this is public information, okay? It means on the web, right? It, there's no corporate espionage taking place here. This is public information, layman's terms, and it's just clear as day. It is clear as day. Layman's terms. The CEO of CVS, this is what he said. In layman's terms, this means we're going to try and make as much money as we possibly can. The amount of money that we're going to make is ultimately going to depend upon how sophisticated or how unsophisticated our clients are. And that starts with the contract. You can spreadsheet all day long, all you want. Hasn't helped for a decade and a half to get cost down. All the spreadsheeting you want, hasn't helped. The contract and the scoring of that contract around transparency is how you get to lowest net cost. I talked about the PBM management fees and I'm wrapping up here, stay with me. The whole reason you're here is coming up. I talked about the PBM's management fee or their service fee, same thing. How much are they being paid to be the PBM? How much are they putting in their bank account at the end of the month, at the end of the year, to be a client's PBM. The PBM's management fee, we've come up with this acronym here, earnings after cash disbursements. Everything in green at some point lands in the PBM's bank account. You could even, and I'm just trying to keep it simple here, okay? We could even take out dispensing fees and plug in DIR fees. So DF could be DIR fees, either one. But the point I'm making is, is that everything in green lands in the PBM's bank account. The non-fiduciary PBM is trying its best to hold on to as much of that that has landed in their bank account as possible. It's true. The money that leaves that bank account are cash disbursements in red. An example would be when a PBM has to reimburse a pharmacy for, remember the, 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 the reimbursement uh, system model. PBM has to reimburse a pharmacy or remember the formulary rebates, the inflow of cash being too low. That's a cash disbursement. Whatever is left over, is what the state of Ohio decided, no, we're not gonna pay you that. We, we make a pretty decent living charging a fair administrative fee. Make a pretty decent living charging a fair administrative fee. It makes no sense to me. It makes no sense to me to be paying $70, 80 
per claim to a PBM. The new path, getting away from the status quo, the new path says this. The PBM's got to make money one way. That's the ideal scenario through the administrative fee. If you're going to allow it to make money another way, maybe keeping a part of the rebates, that's okay too, as long as you know exactly what they're keeping, as long as you know exactly how much you're paying them. That's the point. I could care less. If you allow the PBM to, to take spreads, uh, to take rebates and pay them administrative fee, as long as you know exactly how much that amounts to, to the penny. The easiest way to go about that is right there on your screen. I'm bringing all this home now. Last year, we bought this client, uh, bought this client on. Uh, and their cost based upon a PM PM per member per month was $57.88. When we wrapped up 2020, their cost was $23.12. That's all in. That's our fee, that's ingredient cost, also rebates. All in, we cut their cost by 60%. The PBM's management fee, the earnings after cash disbursements, Prime Therapeutics was essentially charging to be the PBM, this client, 5788 minus 2312, essentially $35 PM PM. That's conservative. That's conservative. I talked about education uh, uh, being key in this whole thing, and it makes a difference, and it makes a different fast difference fast. We're the first and only PBM to offer a certification around pharmacy benefits. And it's about you. It's about transparency. It's about making healthcare operate and perform efficiently and better. If you're interested or you like what you heard today, go out online, type in the word CPBS, and investigate whether or not uh, this program is a is a good fit uh, for you. Eli Broad, he pronounces it Broad. Um, I know about him because the, the business school I went to was named after this cat. The only person in, in the world to be the founder of two Fortune 500 companies. He invested in his retirement, most of it, a lot of his earnings in healthcare research. He believes education is the key. Who am I to disagree with? All right, that is my time today. Don't be like me when I go to a car dealership and I need a repair on my automobile and I know nothing about automobiles. So I try to convince the repairman that I know something about automobiles because the only thing I have a chance of is the perception that I know what I'm talking about. Inevitably, I end up declining services that I need and allowing services that I don't. That's what's happening in the PBM industry today. Get smart, get sophisticated about it. Give the PBMs a little bit of their own medicine. That's my time today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Here's my contact information. We're on the same team here. Let me know how I can help. Otherwise, listen, we're not quite out of the woods yet with this, uh, you know, this Delta variant. Everyone be safe. Keep your family safe. We'll talk soon. Thank you.